Hey, this is Toby. We're in North Beach, San Francisco right now to meet up with legendary artist Winston Smith. Later. Pleasure to meet Pleasure. you, Toby. Toby, good to meet you. Yeah, that's it. It's a awesome. Two worlds. Thank you. Yeah, so this is it. Welcome to uh, Grant's Tomb. We're right under Grant Avenue. So this is mainly my work that I've had up for a show, and then uh, I generally pull curtains across so people don't have to look at my chaotic studio part. I was born in Oklahoma, and um, when I was a teenager, I had the brilliant idea to uh, go to art school uh, and went to study uh, Renaissance art in, in, in Florence. My mom was a painter and a sculptress, really talented, and I didn't unfortunately inherit her skills. Um, I can sketch and draw like you know if I want to really well, but mm -hmm. uh, usually uh, too much effort. Uh, so it's easier to cut up other people's drawings <laughs> and use those. Um, and I kind of discovered uh, the medium of collage before there were photocopy machines. Mm -hmm. I would make my own drawings and then realize if I cut them up, I could mix them together and come up with really absurdist compositions that were startling. And um, once I did see a photocopy machine, I think Xerox or Olivetti, in Italy we had Olivetti, and uh, that kind of changed everything because you could rearrange pictures together, photocopy it, and it would make them all look like one unit. At that time and for a long, long time afterward, whenever I would present this work or composition, especially for commercial work like illustration for a magazine, they go, you know, the art directors would say, well, it's not a painting and, and it's not a photograph, and, and it, so what is it? And so I'm trying to create instant surrealism, you know, uh, that you could get. I could take a bunch of completely normal things mm -hmm. and put them together and they're not right. Biafra one time said, you take things that are all wrong, put them together and, they, and suddenly make them right. That's a piece we use for uh, Dead Kennedy's record in the middle, um, mowing down the people. It was on the inside of a, of a record. Do you ever have brushes with the law or calls from authorities about any of your work? No, I think I'm either so much under the radar or they probably figure, oh, let him keep doing that. That way he won't cause any real trouble. <laughs> you know, he's just an artist. A lot of articles talk about um, how, you know, you coming back to the States after being away for six oh, years or so it was, was a real culture shock, yeah. When I first arrived in America, I had two friends who lived here one who lived in Boston, in New York and Boston, he moved to Boston, and then one friend who lived out in San Francisco. The, the part of Boston I lived in was right by the river, by the Char uh, Charles River. Um, the uh, uh, sh kind of the shock was that there were TV cameras everywhere, mm. not just at banks and office buildings, but at donut shops, you know, and like these little, like, little cameras that would follow you around. And I think, son of a bitch, it's like, you know, Orwell would. So you were in Boston then, and then how, how did you get it? Over to San Francisco. I hitchhiked across the country. <laughs> San Francisco was uh, full of uh, uh, energy. It's a small city. It's only seven miles across, so you can walk around. In fact, there was a bus strike for a couple of weeks, and I did have to walk around everywhere to find anything. Where I wound up working was like a rent a roadie joint, uh, you know, working for different bands like the Tubes, uh, uh, Cross with Sills and Nash, Santana, uh, Journey, a bunch of other local bands would come in and perform at our, our sound stages. I did run into lots of interesting people in that industry and it was right just before punk rock had begun to rear its ugly head. That yeah, so what, what, what year span are we talking right now? 76 and 77. A lot of places wouldn't book punk bands at that time because uh, of too much trouble. You know, they couldn't, the insurance wouldn't cover. Uh, the place if the windows got broken or if someone got hurt. And that's why punk rock, I think, was born, because so many people who did want to perform were kind of pissed off that 
all there was was these giant stadium bands. All mm -hmm. there was was this like big show business stuff. Mm -hmm. And punk rock was about, no, just get up on stage in the corner of someone's room, you know, in a basement someplace. San Francisco was more of an art, art movement mm -hmm. for the punk scene because there were people who were artists that couldn't play anything. But they'd perform and they'd, they'd have like an act, you know, usually it was funny or it was absurd, it was something interesting. You, uh, you mentioned in uh, some interviews um, about that, that, that time uh, and the spirit that infused the music and the art uh, is kind of resemblant of Dadaism. Totally. Advertising here doesn't take the form so much of, you know, TV ads or radio or, or billboards, it, it's posters. and. We had the opportunity, because people have to walk around, to, to put posters or propaganda for a band, or for anything really, on walls that you'd have to see if you're waiting for the bus or, or walking down the block. Sometimes I'd see this and I'd think, well, you know, I, I could do that. <laughs> it's like, uh, I don't think I could do better, but I could do something like that. And I didn't know a lot of the people in the current scene that was coming up. I didn't know people in bands, so I just made up my own punk bands and put up posters for like, you know, the Twits. Uh, yeah, on non-existent bands. Well, there was no Kinko's then. You had to go to the Rexall, you know, and put a dime in the thing, or we'd go to the public library and there'd be a, a Olivetti machine or a Xerox machine. You could do like whole, like zines, you know, on the, at, at Rexall. And that was, uh, uh, oh. Well, one of these was, uh, you know, the people must believe that they are not manipulated in order for them to be manipulated effectively. That turned into a compilation album. The name Dead Kennedys, I think, inspired how you first reached out to Jello? We're uh, kind of the same age. He's uh, somewhat a few years younger, younger than me. So I have, like, vivid memories of JFK's assassination as an as a 11-year-old, as a teenager. And, 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 and what that did to the rest of the society. Your career, there's been points where people have reacted um, and uh, to your work uh, uh, negatively and sometimes extremely negatively. Um, yeah, uh -huh. And I think that, you know, the example <laughs> that, yeah, you're pointing across there, you know, I think that the Pat Robertson 700 Club uh, instance was an interesting one. This, we use a picture I had done a few years before for a Dead Kennedys record. It was an EP. My piece was a cross of dollars, uh, of American dollars with uh, Jesus on the cross. It was about, you know, greed and religion and corruption and, you know, essentially how money controls things, how people worship money. That mm. it wasn't really very profound. So we used it for the record. And then in Great Britain, they banned the record cover and big posters that were in the window, like table-sized posters from record shops because people complained because they thought, said it was heresy, which meant they took the records out of the shops and Biafra thought it was horrible, this is terrible publicity, and I was going, no, it's great, it's no such thing as bad publicity, you should write the cops a check, you know, <laughs> you, should, you should like send them a thank you note. <laughs> Have you always had a purpose, either political or social, with your work? No. <laughs> no. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I just, a lot of things that I have, I'll put together because they look funny or interesting or kind of intriguing or enigmatic that way. Some of your work has a definite intent. One of the uh, pieces that it gets brought up a lot is the, um, the baby being fed by the, uh, by the... Oh, the bomb. The, the yeah, bomb. baby and the yeah. bomb. Force-fed yeah. war. That was about when Ronald Reagan was, was president in 82, 83, and he cut off the school lunch program for children, which was sometimes the only meal they had in, in, in a day, and give all the money to the Pentagon. The best thing about that rocket that, that the baby is being fed, the real thing on the tail said 666 DBH or some other code number. I just had to black out the code number and the 666 was already there. What drives you? Is it frustration that drives you to continue to, be, continue to be working like 59 years? That actually is a good motivator. A lot of it is, you know, just the desire to put what is subconscious onto paper. 
we have a responsibility as artists uh, to express ourselves. I think even you know even even us you know we might change our mind you know ten or twenty years later and go oh you know I was probably wrong about that now I see it differently.